she started out as a waitress and a baker at Cafe Lena in 1975, and that's where she met Dave Van Ronk, who encouraged her to come to New York City to study guitar. Luckily, she took that advice, and it led to her career as a singer, songwriter, guitarist, recording artist, author, videographer, and cheerleader for the contemporary folk world. Now, in May of 2021, Christine received an honorary doctorate in fine arts from her alma mater, the State University of New York at Brockport. And coincidentally, the same month that she received her honorary doctorate, her younger brother, who's also named Chris, was awarded his honorary doctorate in humane letters from his alma mater, Hobart William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. Quite an honor. By the way, next Saturday, Christine will be doing a special show with another Greenwich Village Folk Festival alumni, Tina Ross. They'll be at the Cooperage in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. But tonight, we are so happy that she could be with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Christine Lavin. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Yeah, it's a thrill that both Christopher and I, you know, we call each other the other Chris Lavin. And we both got doctorates within a week of each other. And our siblings that have real master's degrees, which neither Chris or I have, are not happy about this, that we just kind of <laughs> leapfrogged over. But um, I, I would love to say hello to Alan Pepper and Eileen Pepper, who are watching in Englewood, New Jersey. Alan owned the bottom line for 30 years. And one of the great things about club owners around the country is that a lot of them give an open door policy to performers who play their clubs. So we're allowed to come in and see other performers um, without having to pay because we're, we're always you know, struggling that way. And so many friendships blossomed at the bar, at the bottom line, and also at the tables. And um, so, hi, Alan. Hi, Eileen. Great to see you. Um, I'm replacing Robin Beto because Robin has a cold, just garden variety cold. Don't worry, nothing serious. And just by coincidence, uh, when I got the call to replace him, this organization called New York State Music asked if they could do a story about a song that I wrote many, many years ago. And it was posted just this afternoon. And so I quickly practiced the song because it's one that I don't do that often. And it's about a, a very a, a terrible anniversary that we're coming up to and that is the day that John Lennon lost his life and I live just a few blocks from there now and I lived even closer when um, when it actually happened and I remember that night it's by the way it's so wonderful to see Wanda Fisher doing the emceeing she's so good and she just celebrated 40 years on the air herself up in the Albany area uh, W-A-M-C, right? That's the name of the station. And, um, but I remember that night when John Lennon was shot that Vin Scalsa was on the air and many people, many, many people called him. He was, I think, on K-Rock or W-N-E-W. -E I don't remember. He's been on a bunch of stations. And he just opened the phone lines up and it, it was just a natural place for people to express their grief and outrage and sorrow over what had happened that night. And about a year later, I was coming in from a long trip on the road. I remember it very clearly because I hadn't slept at all. And um, I was stuck in traffic right outside the Dakota where John Lennon lived and then a song of his came on the radio. It was a Monday morning. I was coming in from a long trip on the road. A flat 
cab near the east side terminal I said please take me home you drove up along third avenue crossed through central park when we came out at 72nd street I felt a cold chill in my heart every time I see the Dakota Think about that night Shots ringing out The angry shouts A man losing his life Well, it's something We shouldn't dwell upon But it's something We shouldn't ignore Too many good men Have been cut down Let's pray There will Shower traffic was bottled up. We slowly hinged by. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't help staring at the scene of the crime. There was an old man sweeping last night's dirt out of the dark and vestibule, and a uniform. Shots ringing out, the angry shouts, a man losing his life. Well, it's something we shouldn't dwell upon, but it's something we shouldn't ignore. Too many good men have been put down. Let's pray they won't be.
going to do. But, and I want to thank New York State Music for writing about that, that song. Um, now, what I've got here is a book. And I'm going to read you chapter 21, which was kind of inspired by Robin Bateau. Chapter 21 is called, Yeah, I'm Always the First One You Think Of If She's Busy. Okay. Now, what I've done is I've typed it out on my screen here so I can tell you the story. This is absolutely true. I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried. Although I have made my living all these years on stage, I've never had formal training. I just play my guitar, tell my stories, and sing songs the best I can. So when I got a phone call in the summer of 1998 asking me to play the part of evil stepsister Minerva in a one-time only benefit performance of Cinderella, I quickly said no. It was my friend violinist Robin Bateau on the other end of the line. And he was calling from a small theater in Connecticut where his neighbor Paul was putting on a night of entertainment to raise money for a summer camp. The centerpiece of the entertainment was a spoof of Cinderella and Robin was the musical director. He just got word that the actress who was cast to play Minerva had to drop out. He needed me in Connecticut in two days, which my routing had me going through anyway. So there really was no reason why I couldn't do it. But I interrupted him, telling him I have zero theater experience. I'm not the girl for the job. But Chris, Robin Bateau said, it's a benefit for Paul Newman's Hole in the Wall gang camp for kids with cancer. Oh my God, how could I say no to that? Robin gave me the address of the 300-seat theater on the grounds of the camp and told me to be there at 2 o'clock Saturday afternoon for rehearsal. My friend Lois Dino was road managing that weekend, so I called her and to let her know that we were going to have an extra stop on our journey. Robin left out a few details that we learned when we arrived. The script was co-written by Paul Newman. That was his neighbor, Paul, and A.E. Hotchner, and the evil stepmother was being played by Carol King. One of the evil stepsisters was Carol's daughter, Louise Goffin. The narrator of the play, I'm not kidding you about this, was Joanne Woodward. The fairy godmother was Nathan Lane. The fairy godfather was Paul Newman. There were two princes fighting over Cinderella, in this version of the show. One was Broadway star James Naughton, and the other was beloved actor Tony Randall. And Cinderella was being played by Julia Roberts. Tickets cost $1,000, and it was sold out. Now, before you get all excited on my behalf, try to imagine how I might have felt walking into this situation. I was starstruck and terrified. Well, Lois, Dino, and I arrived five minutes before the one and only rehearsal. So the stage manager thrust a script into my hands and told me to sit down on a bench next to Carol King and Louise Goffin. Joanne Woodward stood at a podium and explained to the audience what they were about to see. And all I remember hearing was the end when she said, and here comes poor Cinderella. Her stepmother and stepsisters are so mean to her. That was Julia Roberts' cue to come crawling on her hands and knees across the stage. First, she polished Louise's shoes, then mine, and then she moved on to Carol. I couldn't help myself. Even though I had no lines in the scene, I leaned down, pointed at my right shoe, and I said, You missed a spot. If you think I'm kidding, I have to show you this picture. Let's see. Can you see this? See, there's, there's Julia Roberts. And there's me. <laughs> and I'm telling you, you missed a spot. Oh. Well, anyway. Without a word, Julia Roberts repolished my right shoe and then went on with the scene. I was so proud. I ad-libbed a line to Julia Roberts, and she ad-libbed a response. 
I'm an actress. <laughs> Later on came my big moment. Joanne read, Minerva is a singer and has dreams of going to Hollywood to become a big star. That was my cue to step forward with my guitar and sing the first verse of my song. What was I thinking? Then I sat down again. Later on, I had a scene with Tony Randall where he had all the women of the kingdom try on Cinderella's glass slipper, which in this version was a silver stiletto Manolo Blahnik. And also in this version of Cinderella, everything works out for everyone at the end. And Joanne read, and the fairy godmother takes Minerva to Hollywood where she becomes a big singing sensation. At that, Nathan Lane took me by the arm and swept me off stage. There were a few more loose ends tied up. Cinderella and the cute prince, Jim Norton, lived happily ever after. And then we all sang a song, an old fashioned standard to which A.E. Hotchner had written some new lyrics to reflect this new Cinderella story. We gathered around the piano and were handed lyric sheets. I stood next to Nathan Lane, smiled at him, and told him I was a big fan. He said, thank you. Then we sang through the song a couple of times. Walking off stage, I said to him how nervous I was, how I had never been in a play before. He rolled his eyes and walked away. Uh-oh. Now, we were all assigned one of two large dressing rooms. The guys in one, the girls in the other. Yes, I was in a dressing room with Carol King, Louise Goffin, and Julia Roberts. Julia was in underwear, thong underwear. Why does Julia Roberts wear thong underwear? Because she can, and she looks great. Since Minerva was supposed to be mean and nasty, I was given an ugly outfit to wear to make me look even worse. I still couldn't believe I was going to be in this play. I felt like I had stepped through the looking glass and I was just praying I would get through the experience and not do anything that would ruin the play or Robin Bateau's reputation. I wondered how many people he called before he dialed me. Why did I say yes? The theater opened. The seats quickly filled. For the opening scene, I took my place on the bench next to Louise Goffin and Carol King. Joanne Woodward made her speech. Julia Roberts crawled across the floor and polished my shoes. I didn't ad lib any lines this time. I was trying to be a professional. Later on, I got up and sang a verse of what was I thinking. It got very little reaction from the crowd, but that was okay. They had no idea who I was. The first verse does a little more than set up the song, and on its own, it isn't very satisfying. I was just, just relieved that I remembered the lyrics and kept the plot moving. Later, Tony Randall tried the silver shoe on my foot. Then he moved on to Louise Goffin's foot. I started to breathe easier. Oh, I had only one more thing to do. It was almost over. This wasn't so bad after all. I'm an actress. In the last scene, and everything works out. Joanne Woodward read, and the fairy godmother brings Minerva to Hollywood where she becomes a big singing sensation. With that, I stood up smiling, waiting for Nathan Lane to sweep me off stage. I waited and I waited. No Nathan. I waited some more. Joanne Woodward fumbled with her script and looked around. I looked around. Where was Nathan? What was I supposed to do? Dead silence. Joanne repeated the line a little slower and a little louder. And the fairy godmother brings Minerva to Hollywood where she becomes a big singing sensation. I have no idea how much time ticked by, maybe 10 seconds, but it felt like an eternity. Since I was supposed to go off into the wings, spirited away by my fairy godmother, I went to plan B and started to spin myself there. So I stuck my arms out and I started madly spinning, aiming for the opening near the back of the stage to my left. As I got closer and closer, I got dizzier and dizzier. I'm getting dizzy just as I type this. I don't know how a dancer spot. I, I was just spinning like an idiot. Soon, I was close enough to throw myself into the darkness, 
So that's what I did. I banged into a piece of furniture in the wings that fell with a big crash, and I heard the audience laughing. When I righted myself, who was standing in front of me holding a script and frowning? Paul Newman. <laughs> what are you doing? He whispered. Making up your own lines? And who the hell are you? I said, Nathan, he was supposed to come get me. I whispered back, but he didn't come get me. I know what to do. I've never been in a play. I'm a folk singer. Robin Brad told me asked me to do this. I've never been in a play. I'm a folk singer. I stopped jabbering long enough because the, the lights finally came up and we all had to go back on stage and sing the final song. I was so traumatized that I just moved my lips, closed my eyes and pretended that I was invisible. Nathan Lane was there for the finale, but why had he left me hanging? I wanted to ask him what happened. There was a party following the play where audience and actors mingled. I saw Nathan dressed all in black, smiling and chatting with people. He looked happy and in a good mood. I was too scared to talk to him. Maybe I shouldn't have told him I had never been in a play. Maybe he didn't want to share a scene with a rookie. Maybe he was teaching me a lesson. Maybe that part was changed and nobody told me. I will never know. But I do know that if in your first play you share a dressing room and a stage with Julia Roberts, there is only one direction you could go from there. My theatrical career began, peaked, then crashed and burned all on the same night, the night I got yelled at by Paul Newman. By the way, the actress I was filling in for that night, Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah, I'm always the first one you think of if she's busy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Chris, I, I always think of you and Sarah Jessica Parker. <laughs> could, could, could we have another song? Would you mind by sharing one more? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> well, you know what? I, well, let me retune really quick. By the way, um, it's so great to see Cozy Sheridan. She's got a song that is going to be on compilation I'm working on of all summer songs and it's her song that she did the last time that she was at the Greenwich Village Folk Festival and it's about rain because in the summertime you know everybody thinks it's all gonna be all songs about the sun and, and the ocean but there's rain, and it's very, very necessary. And she wrote the most beautiful song about rain. And when I heard it, I asked her to send it to me. But I thought somebody was talking about, uh, well, Cosie was talking about her dad. And um, I think this is, a, this, this is a problem. I wrote this for the, the Guthrie Center. Uh, on, uh, in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. They asked every performer who worked there in 2012 to write a song that you think Woody Guthrie would be writing if he were alive today. And I thought, hmm, what's a problem that I have that Woody Guthrie would also have? And I think Cozy's dad would have to. Way back last century, I joined America Online. Had to come up with a password, something uniquely mine. I picked the word lightning. I have no idea why. Light is gonna be my password until the day I die. Whoop. <laughs> Remember how it felt to have your first password and become a member of the cyber generation? How proud we all were of ourselves. Then I opened an account with Amazon. They wanted a password too. So again, I picked the word lightning. It was a logical thing to do. Then I changed.
join Facebook Is it a single word that's not sufficient They want both the letters and numbers To be safe and efficient So I added number 52 To my word lightning Lightning 52 is my Facebook password My online skills are heightening But then I read it's dangerous To use the same password everywhere So I thought, okay, what's well, easy to remember And a company's lightning up in the air thunder that'll be my new password as i download itunes but they also want a number so thunder one is what i picked that afternoon then i joined satellite radio another password to create what goes with lightning and thunder hail that'll work just great they said no hail is too short a word but hailstones, that works fine. I've already come a long way from lightning and obsolete America online. Then I joined Gmail, lightning, thunder, hailstones, twister. But they tell me that's a weak password, so I could solve my little sister. Now, when you have computer trouble, you can't go to anybody older and wiser. Because guess what? There is nobody older and wiser. I know a woman whose three-year-old helps her out when she's got trouble. So my sister said, how about the word hurricane? But add a number and make it secure. So Hurricane 53, but let, get, let the bad guys get out of my door. So far, so good. Till the day Facebook let me know. Somebody hacked into my account. My old password has got to go. Oh, no. Lightning 52 became Lightning 53, but only for a couple of weeks. Cause then my account got hacked again, and my password needed tweaks. But Lightning 54 was rejected. They said it was way too close to Lightning 53. So I made a bold choice. Humidity 9, that's the new password for me. And everything was A-OK, -okay. till the day I let a friend use my laptop. She did something to my AOL account that brought her to a screeching stop. They said she emailed way too many people. My account got jumped. I could reopen it in 24 hours, but my password was now defunct. So AOL gave me a new password. My zip code and my initials. They said if I didn't like it, I could change it back to something more creative and less official. Well, I tried changing it back to light. They said, nope. You gotta pick another word. So for whatever reason at that particular moment in time, Typhoon 56 is what I prefer. Lightning, lightning 52, thunder one, okay. Hailstones here. This is the sing-along part. Weren't you paying attention? Hail, lightning 53, lightning 54. I'm starting to confuse myself. What are those the passwords for? Humidity 9, CL10025. I think I'm starting to overload my brain's external drive. Typhoon 56. I don't remember what that does. If only I could go back to the time when lightning was the only password I had to remember. The only password to memorize The only password to open sesame Everything under digital skies But the days of the single, simple password For ancient history I'm gonna change my password to I'm an old idiot One, two, three And now, thank you, Christine. How how are you doing? You still going a little bit crazy there? My kids laugh at me when I start to make up passwords. They they think I'm crazy, um, but of course, their passwords aren't easy to figure out either, right? Right.